Internet of Things atau IoT sebagai salah satu ciri dari era 4.0 sehingga digitalisasi asik mutlak untuk dilakukan selain untuk kepentingan kecepatan akses juga untuk melindungi fisik asik sebagai nilai budaya dan hukum Arsip audiovisual itu unik ya karena dia arsip yang secara uh, visual harus diperlihatkan harus menggunakan player untuk memutarnya dan uh, dengan peralatan itu nanti akan ada tampilan ya uh, karena dia adalah gambar yang bergerak dengan adanya suara audiovisual itu juga merupakan salah satu arsip yang untuk menyimpannya juga harus sesuai dengan medianya di depo penyimpanan yang khusus ya dengan suhu kelembapan yang harus terjaga disimpan sesuai dengan uh, ketentuan uh, dengan standar dan handlingnya juga harus hati-hati dengan beberapa kriteria untuk handling dan itu pun juga uh, ada resiko untuk uh, bahwa media audiovisual itu akan cepat usang media audiovisual itu pada saatnya nanti akan uh, sulit untuk dicari pembacanya atau mesin atau player maka uh, untuk inilah urgensinya diperlukan akselerasi untuk segera didigitalisasi karena kalau tidak arsip itu nanti secara informasi dia akan terkubur dengan sendirinya Konversi arsip dari analog ke digital perlu dilakukan segera mungkin karena pertama kondisi arsip audiovisual bersifat tidak lama dan sangat rentan terhadap kerusakan bagi kita yang tinggal di iklim tropis. Kemudian juga arsip audiovisual rentan terhadap kerusakan yang diakibatkan oleh salah penanganan oleh operator dan kerusakan ala akan alat baca audiovisual. Selain itu, ketersediaan alat baca arsip audiovisual yang semakin berkurang dikarenakan penyedia layanan player audiovisual sudah mulai berhenti memproduksi unit maupun spare partnya. Yang terakhir, bahwa salah penanganan arsip audiovisual dalam hal upgrade, peralatan lunak, dan perangkat keras juga bisa menyebabkan kerusakan bagi arsip audiovisual. Untuk itu, Arsip Nasional Republik Indonesia sudah melakukan perencanaan preservasi arsip audiovisual melalui prosedur alih media bagi arsip audiovisual baik yang ada dalam koleksi Arsip Nasional Republik Indonesia maupun masyarakat yang membutuhkan. Arsip yang sudah dalam bentuk digital tadi, yaitu harus disimpan dalam sebuah repository yang terpercaya ya karena uh, untuk menyimpan arsip digital untuk long term preservation ya di samping itu juga untuk mendukung digital preservation ya uh, ya kalau di Andri kita mempunyai fasilitas yang namanya depot elektronik ya dengan uh, server storage yaitu silent brick yang untuk menyimpan data digital kualitas tinggi Satukan langkah mewujudkan arsip digital menjadi tema peringatan Hari Kearsipan Nasional Indonesia yang ke-50 sebagai satu upaya arsip nasional Republik Indonesia untuk menyikapi transformasi digital baik dalam skala nasional maupun global. Apabila kita gagal dalam transformasi digital, pasti kita akan terdestruksi dan kalah dalam berbagai hal. Selanjutnya, arsip digital harus kita kelola dengan baik Jangan sampai masa depan tidak lagi menjadi milik kita karena kita lale menjaga informasi yang kita miliki.
Mohon perhatian kepada Bapak dan Ibu, acara akan segera kami mulai. Selamat pagi, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Salam, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Yang terhormat pelaksana tugas Deputi Bidang Konservasi Arsip, Ibu Dr. Anda Multisiswati MM, yang kami hormati Koordinator Kelompok Penyimpanan Arsip, Bapak Dani Sugiarto, Eskom Mkom, yang kami hormati pula para narasumber, Bapak Ray Edmondson dan Bapak Mick Nyunham, serta Bapak dan Ibu peserta webinar yang berbahagia. Puji dan syukur kita panjatkan kehadirat Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, Tuhan Yang Maha Esa, karena atas berkat rahmatnya pada hari ini, Selasa 21 September 2021, kita semua diberikan kesehatan dan diperkenankan untuk dapat bergabung, baik dalam aplikasi Zoom Meeting maupun melalui channel YouTube Arsip Nasional RI dalam acara Magnetic Tape Preservation and Transfer to Digital. Bapak dan Ibu yang berbahagia mengawali acara pada pagi hari ini, marilah bersama-sama kita menyanyikan lagu kebangsaan Indonesia Raya dan dilanjutkan dengan Mars Karsipan Indonesia. Hadirin dimohon untuk duduk dengan sikap sempurna.
Sipan, sebagai jati diri bangsa kita Selalu responsif, anti simpati, bersikap profesional Sinergikan semangat perubahan, satukan langkah dalam menjayakan Kami menjadi bersejajar asyik, sebagai bukti akuntabilitas kinerja Segala tantangan Pakai jadi bangsa Indonesia Terlepas kekasihan Di Republik Indonesia Tujuh tinggi identitas bangsa Jangan warisan Nasional dan budaya Demi kejayaan Indonesia Terkasihan Republik Bapak dan Ibu yang berbahagia, tentunya kita berharap agar acara pada hari ini dapat berjalan dengan tertib dan lancar. Untuk itu, marilah kita berdoa yang akan dipandu oleh Bapak Dwi Ari Wibowo. Kepada Bapak Dwi Ari Wibowo, kami persilakan. Terima kasih atas waktunya kepada MC. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi dan selamat sejahtera untuk kita semua. Mohon izin, saya akan memandu doa secara Islam kepada Bapak dan Ibu yang hadir. Dimohon berkenan untuk menyesuaikan menurut agama dan kepercayaan masing-masing. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Salatu wassalamu ala asrafil ahli rahim wal mursalim wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa ismail. Asyadu ala ilaha 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 Allah wa asyadu anna muhammadin abdul wa rasul. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ala sayyidina muhammad. Kama salli ta'ala ibrahim wa ala ala ibrahim. Mubarik ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ala sayyidina muhammad. Kama barak ta'ala ibrahim wa ala ala ibrahim. Fil alamina inna hamidun majid. Ya Allah, Ya Tuhan kami, tiada kata dan rasa yang pantas kami haturkan kepada Engkau. Selain syukur kami padamu, atas nikmat dan karunia yang telah Engkau anugerahkan kepada kami. Sehingga kami pada hari ini, tanggal 21 September 2021, dapat hadir dalam keadaan sehat dan sempat untuk mengikuti workshop online preservasi asing sesi kedua dengan tema Magnetic Tech Preservation dan Reflection. dan transfer ke digital. Maka dengan itu, Ya Allah, kami memohon rindu dan izin berkahilah semua langkah dan perbuatan kami dan jadikanlah ini semua sebagai nilai ibadah dalam ikhtiar kami melaksanakan tugas dan tanggung jawab kami. Ya Allah, yang maha mengetahui ilmu-mu begitu luas dan tak terbatas. Oleh karena itu, anugerahkanlah kepada kami ilmu yang bermanfaat sebagai bekal kami dalam menjalani hidup dan kehidupan. Serta berilah kami kekuatan untuk mampu mengamalkan ilmu yang telah engkau anugerahkan kepada kami. Limpahkanlah kepada kami yang hadir pada acara kali ini kesehatan, kekuatan, kemudahan, dan keikhlasan, serta kecerdasan dan kearifan dalam mengikuti webinar yang kami selenggarakan. Ya Allah yang maha pengasih lagi maha penyayang, Jagalah raga dan jiwa kami selalu dalam keadaan sehat dan semangat. Jauhkanlah kami dari rasa malas dalam menuntut ilmu, agar kami dapat terhindar dari rasa pahitnya kebodohan. Ya Allah sebaik-baik pelindung, kami berlindung kepadamu dari rasa sedih dan duka. Kami berlindung kepadamu dari rasa letih dan lemah. Dan kami berlindung kepadamu dari kesalahan yang terlanjur kami lakukan. Ya Allah yang maha pemurah, engkau yang maha pengampun atas segala dosa, Ampunilah dosa kami, dosa kedua orang tua kami, dosa para pemimpin kami, dosa para pahlawan serta para pendahulu kami. Tempatkanlah kami dan mereka semua di dalam lindungan rahmat dan ampunanmu. Ya Allah yang maha mulia, kabulkanlah permohonan dan bekal kami, serta masukkanlah kami ke dalam golongan orang-orang yang pandai bersyukur. Rabbana dolamna angkusana wa ilam takfirlana wa tarhamna nakunana minal khasirin. 
ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وحي لنا من أمرنا رشدا ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا أذابا سبحانا كربك رب العزة أما يسكون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bapak dan Ibu yang kami hormati Sebagai pembukaan acara pada hari ini Maka akan disampaikan sambutan oleh pelaksana tugas Deputi Bidang Konservasi Arsip Yang terhormat Ibu Dr. Anda Multi Siswa TMM kami persilakan Terima kasih Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya. Salam kebajikan. Salam sehat, salam asyik. Yang terhormat narasumber Bapak Ray Edmondson, mantan presiden siapa apa, pakar keasipan audiovisual dan juga memory of the word yang kami nantikan saya penulisnya untuk kemajuan dunia keasipan di Indonesia. Kepada narasumber Yuman, juga mantan presiden siapa apa dan sebagai pakar keasipan audiovisual di Australia yang kami nantikan juga saya penulisnya untuk kemajuan dunia keasipan di Indonesia. Atas nama pimpinan Arsip Nasional Republik Indonesia, saya menyampaikan terima kasih kepada para narasumber yang telah bersedia sharing knowledge pada workshop kali ini. Dan yang terhormat para pejabat struktural dan fungsional di lingkungan ASIP Nasional Republik Indonesia, para peserta workshop yang ada di ruang Zoom dan di kanal YouTube ASIP Nasional Republik Indonesia. Hadirin sekalian yang saya hormati, pertama-tama marilah kita memanjatkan puji dan syukur kehadirat Allah Subhanahu wa taala, Tuhan Yang Maha Kuasa. Karena atas perkenannya kita dapat bersama-sama menghadiri acara workshop secara online menggunakan aplikasi Zoom Meeting dalam rangka workshop preservasi arsip series ke-7 dengan tema Magnetic Tape Preservation dan Transfer to, and Transfer to Digital. Workshop ini diselenggarakan dalam rangkaian peringatan Hari Kearsipan Nasional yang ke-50 di Indonesia tahun 2021 dalam tagline Satu Langkah Menuju Arsip Digital. Semangat berteknologi tersebut memberikan pesan kepada kita bahwa internal of team, aktivitas serba internet benar-benar telah kita alami. Kami ucapkan terima kasih juga untuk para panelistia yang bersusah payah mengkoordinasi, mengkoordinir acara workshop ini sehingga bisa terlaksana dengan baik dengan banyak tantangan sebagai panitia harus berada di rumah masing-masing ataupun di tempat yang berada di tempat bukan eh, di satu tempat pandemi covid ini masih berlangsung dan kita harus tetap menerapkan proses eh, prokes hidup sehat hal ini demi melindungi diri dan menjaga kesehatan kita masing-masing dari ancaman pandemi semoga narasumber kita Mr. Ray Edmondson dan Mr. Mignyuhanhem juga dalam keadaan sehat walafiat. Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati, workshop persepasi seri ketujuh ini menghadirkan narasumber dari Australia. Dua orang pakar asip audiovisual yang telah banyak menerbitkan buku dan menjadi narasumber di berbagai event, serta keduanya pernah menjabat sebagai presiden Siavava. Sebuah organisasi audiovisual di kawasan Asia Tenggara dan Pasifik yang telah banyak berperan dalam menangani arsip audiovisual dan menyelenggarakan event yang bermanfaat besar bagi dunia keasipan, khususnya audiovisual. Narasumber kita kali ini adalah uh, Mr. Ray Edmondson yang juga membawakan topik Magnetic Tape Preservation and Challenge dan Mr. Mick Yunhem yang membawakan topik Making Audiovisual Archive Accessible sebagai salah satu upaya Arsip Nasional Republik Indonesia untuk menyikpat, menyikapi upaya pelestarian arsip dan perkembangan teknologi utamanya dalam menangkap isu teknologi ke arah digital. Arsip audiovisual adalah arsip yang sangat dinamis dengan tampilan visual yang menarik, tetapi mempunyai risiko tinggi dalam upaya pelestariannya. Seperti arsip video seluler, arsip magnetic tape, arsip audio real dan mikrofilm atau mikrofis. 
Dalam melakukan pelestarian dibutuhkan strategi pelestarian yang tepat dengan sarana-prasarana yang memadai. Teknologi arsip audiovisual tercipta untuk mengungkapkan bahasa tubuh karena ada gambar dan ada suara. Bisa mengungkapkan bahasa, dialek dan etnik, musik dengan detail terhadap eh, getaran. Terhadap gerakan. Maka dibutuhkanlah pemahaman yang tepat terhadap materi pembentuk arsip dari bahan apa arsip itu dibuat dari pembentuk pita magnetik apa agar mendapatkan upaya yang tepat dalam pelestariannya. Terkait perkembangan teknologi utama, terutama dalam digitalisasi arsip audiovisual dan juga penyimpanan digital sangat berpengaruh eh, signifikan. Melakukan percepatan digitalisasi dan menyediakan digital storage adalah komponen penting dari sistem pelestarian digital, terutama pada arsip audiovisual yang membutuhkan penyimpanan pada tingkat yang eksponensial. Artinya, membutuhkan storage lebih besar dengan performance yang cepat dan tangguh. Karena konten audiovisual sangat menarik dan membutuhkan space sangat besar, disitulah dibutuhkan arsiparis yang perlu bersinergi dengan ahli IT untuk berpikir dalam menyatukan solusi penyimpanan yang tepat dan bisa diakses secara luas. Untuk selanjutnya kami mohon para narasumber untuk bisa juga sharing knowledge kepada kami di Indonesia, khususnya terkait arsip tip magnetik seperti kaset-kaset dan real magnetik dan secara luas arsip audiovisual agar mampu meningkatkan kemampuan dan pengetahuan kearsipan khususnya para arsiparis di era teknologi dan era pandemi saat ini. Alhamdulillah hingga saat ini telah terdaftar 1.297 peserta. Banyaknya jumlah peserta yang mengikuti workshop ini diharapkan menjadi bukti kesadaran para anak bangsa untuk menyikapi perkembangan kearsipan yang sedang kita hadapi. Saya selaku pimpinan Lembaga Kearsipan Nasional berharap kepada seluruh pimpinan Lembaga Kearsipan Daerah, perguruan tinggi, pencipta asip dan asip Paris sudah semakin siap untuk memasuki transformasi digital dalam mengelola informasi. Sekian pengantar saya, saya ucapkan selamat mengikuti workshop. Semoga bermanfaat bagi lembaga dan negara yang kita cintai menuju sumber daya manusia unggul Indonesia maju. Terima kasih. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Ibu Multi atas sambutan yang telah disampaikan. Hadirin yang berbahagia, acara akan kami lanjutkan kembali dengan sesi pemaparan materi oleh para narasumber yang akan dipandu oleh moderator, yaitu koordinator kelompok penyimpanan arsip. Kepada Bapak Dani Sugiarto, Eskom Mkom, kami persilakan untuk mengambil alih acara. Baik, terima kasih uh, kepada MC Mbak Perli atas kesempatannya. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang terhormat Ibu Deputi Bidang Konservasi Arsip, Ibu Multi Siswati, yang kami hormati Bapak Direktur Konservasi Arsip, Bapak Kandar, para narasumber, uh, terima kasih telah bergabung dengan kami, Mr. Ray Edmondson dan Mr. Mick Newham. It is uh, such an honor for me uh, to be here with you. I would like to say thank you very much and welcome uh, in the last event, uh, me, uh, Mr. Ray and Mr. Mick had a collaboration in CPV event in the conference in Bandung and Jakarta in 2009. Uh, I still have memorized photo of you. And also for all participants, semua peserta dari seluruh Indonesia, para arsiparis, ya, para praktisi, para peneliti, komunitas, dan lainnya terkait dengan audiovisual maupun uh, kearsipan. Ya. Uh, kami ucapkan terima kasih kehadirannya di uh, workshop ini. Dan uh, saat ini juga ada peserta dari National Archive of Singapore. Uh, ada beberapa yang juga dari luar negeri. Kami ucapkan selamat datang. Uh, saya sebagai moderator, perkenalkan saya Dani Sugiarto, uh, saya akan memandu acara sebagai arsiparis uh, di uh, koordinator substansi penyimpanan arsip di ANRI 
dan saya cukup banyak menimba ilmu dari kedua narasumber, Mr. Ray and Mr. Mick, di uh, konferensi siapa apa maupun workshop di Singapura, maupun dari buku yang diterbitkan, yaitu Audiovisual Archives Philosophy, uh, sangat menginspirasi. Uh, webinar ini dalam rangkaian workshop reservasi arsip uh, secara online, dan saat ini sudah memasuki series ke-7, yang mana workshop ini dilaksanakan oleh Direktorat Konservasi dan ini sebagai cara kami untuk melakukan penguatan materi yang teknikal yang untuk menguatkan kompetensi dan kapabilitas teknikal dalam pengelolaan arsip audiovisual. Sebelum kita memulai, saya akan memperkenalkan para narasumber. Yang pertama adalah Ray, Ray Edmondson. Ray ini banyak terlibat dalam beberapa acara dan ya, saya akan perkenalkan narasumber pertama. Yang pertama adalah Ray Edmondson. Beliau akan menyampaikan topik tentang magnetic tape preservation and the challenge. Berikut biodata Ray Edmondson. Beliau lahir pada 1943, tinggal di sebuah kota kecil di luar Canberra, yaitu di Kambah, di Australia, bersama istrinya Sue. Mempunyai dua putra, dan Ray mendapatkan gelar doktoral di NFSA dan juga pernah berkarir di National Library of Australia dan sebagai inisiator pendirian Film Archive Unit. Kemudian Ray mendirikan National Film and Sound Archive pada 1984, kemudian pensiun sebagai kurator emeritus dan selanjutnya sebagai advisory committee. Dan Ray cukup banyak sekali terlibat dalam berbagai komunitas, ya di federasian lain, musik roll, dan juga komunitas audiovisual lainnya. Ray juga pernah terpilih sebagai presiden siapa-apa dari tahun 1996 sampai 2002, dan pernah menjabat sebagai ex officio konsil siapa-apa sampai 2008. Dan kemudian sebagai chair AMIA, asosiasi yang apa namanya bergerak di bidang arsip ya dan juga pernah juga terlibat di UNESCO program Memory of the World. Ya. Nah eh, pada paparan nanti Ray Edmondson akan menyampaikan terkait dengan konsep umum preservasi kemudian karakter eh, media magnetik ya atau kaset kaset ya di Indonesia ini banyak sekali instansi pemerintah maupun instansi lain yang menyimpan kaset-kaset, menyimpan arsip dalam bentuk magnetic tape ini, sejenis kaset video, rekaman suara, maupun reel, dan di Andri sendiri juga menyimpan sekitar 40 ribuan, dan sebagian besar belum digital, dan ini merupakan masalah umum di Indonesia, ya terutama juga di Andri juga, dan uh, nanti uh, Ray akan banyak menyampaikan banyak hal terkait dengan media magnetik ini, terkait karakternya dan juga kendala-kendalanya, kemudian bagaimana menyelamatkannya, bagaimana metadata dan intelektual properti, dan selanjutnya terkait kasana audiovisual ini ada kendala pada peralatan pemutarnya dan juga beberapa masalah lainnya. Dan untuk selanjutnya, kami persilahkan Ray untuk menyampaikan paparannya. Waktunya 60 menit dari saat ini, kami persilahkan Ray. Time is yours. Good morning. I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> First, I define preservation. Preservation is the totality of things necessary 
to ensure the permanent accessibility forever of an audiovisual document with maximum integrity. Digital preservation combines policies, strategies and actions to ensure access to reformatted and born digital content regardless of the challenges of media failure and technological change. The goal of digital preservation is the accurate rendering of authenticated content over time. Remember that nothing has ever been preserved, it's only being preserved. So let's uh, look at a couple of concepts. Now, uh, digital means discrete, discontinuous representations of information in the form of a binary code, formatted as computer accessible files. It's a sequence of ones and zeros, an abstraction of reality. Analog is the opposite. It refers to signals that behave in a continuous manner as information stored on a physical carrier a real object you can pick up. Here are some references to global standards they all relate to defining the work that we're engaged in. So now I'll speak about the character of the medium. Uh, the visual and audio, audio content of magnetic tapes whether analog or digital, can only be accessed via a machine. The information is coded magnetically and the playback machine has to turn those magnetic impulses into video images and sounds. You can't pick up a tape and expect to see visible pictures, for example. Audio and videotape comprises a long strip of plastic film. It's called the substrate. Coated on one side with a magnetizable metallic oxide. It is fragile and can be easily twisted folded or crumpled. It is subject to deterioration and distortion. Grains of the magnetic coating can start to drop off if the adhesive binding but if the adhesive binding it to the substrate weakens. This is called oxide shedding. And the loose oxide needs to be cleaned off the tape before replaying so that it does not clog the heads in the replay machines. A variation of this effect is called sticky shed syndrome and it's caused by the binder absorbing moisture. Eventually, these effects can make the tape 
unplayable. Magnetic tapes come in many different sizes and containers. Reel-to-reel, -reel, audio and video cassettes. Each format requires its own specific machine for playback. For example, Umatic and VHS videotapes, compact audio cassettes, reel-to-reel -reel audio and videotapes, all require specific machines. In archival terminology, we refer to each physical tape or cassette as a carrier and the signals encoded on the tape as content. <clears throat> Not only are there many different physical, physical carriers, but within some carrier types there are different recording standards or formats. For example, VHS cassettes can accommodate five different formats VHS, VHSC, and three variations of SVHS. Reel to reel audio tapes may be recorded at different speeds, for example, seven and a half inch, three and three quarter inches per second, one and seven eight inches per second. The faster the speed, the higher the quality of the sound. So what information do you have for each carrier? Is there a catalogue or inventory record? Is there additional information on the package in which the carrier is kept? Does it describe the content of the tape? Does it give technical details such as the format, playing speed, etc.? Is there an accessioning or inventory number which locates the tape within the physical collection? There may also be notes or other information which need to be kept as part of the metadata. These might include information about who the tape was acquired from and when, and it might include information about the owner of the intellectual property or copyright. You might need to do some research to flesh out the missing information. Who owns the copyright? The intellectual property that you're digitizing. This will have to be to well, this will have to be documented for every tape because it will control the public accessibility of the material in future. If the ownership is unknown, you will have to take some on, some on balance decisions about what utilization you allow. Details of copyright ownership should be included in the cataloging or inventory record. Housekeeping, collection management. Four walls, a roof, shelves and a lock on the door are essential requirements for managing a collection of tapes. Desirably, the internal environment should be maintained at 18 to 21 degrees Celsius.
and at 45 to 50 percent relative humidity. But where this is not possible, try to get as close as you can. The environment will directly bear on the useful life of the carriers. So will the way the collection is physically arranged, documented and controlled. So conserve space by keeping carriers of similar dimensions together. If you don't yet have one, create a numbering and control system and relate this to the catalogue or inventory. This allows the carrier to be found and monitored. Label and number each carrier individually. Tapes should normally be stored vertically. Remove any extraneous material, plastic bags, paper, cards, rubber bands, etc. from inside the tape containers. <coughs> if you can, Repackage the carriers in archivally neutral containers because commercial tape boxes and sleeves may be acidic. Security is essential. Only approved staff members should have access. And you need to control the movement of carriers so that none get lost. Cleanliness goes without saying and have a disaster preparedness, disaster preparedness regime. Uh, you can go to the Sipava checklist, checklist uh, for further discussion on this. <coughs> Staff training. Staff will need to be trained in the physical care and handling of magnetic media, in recognizing and identifying the format of each item. They will also need to recognize the metadata that needs to be transcribed and kept. It's not just conventional catalog records. It can be notes scribbled on boxes or other containers notes on pieces of paper that might be inside or stuck on those boxes. Some of the information may be technical or may identify the provenance of the carrier. If tape has been kept in humid conditions, mould can grow on it. This has to be carefully removed using appropriate cleaning agents and with regard to protecting your health so you don't breathe in fumes or mould spores. If you are using chemical compounds to clean tapes, be sure you have understood the health risks and safety steps to be taken. Be aware that stray magnetic fields can affect the information encoded on the tapes. For example, if using a vacuum cleaner in the vicinity of the tapes, the electrical field created by the motor could have a demagnetizing effect on the tapes. <clears throat> now equipment. What playback equipment do you have available and what carrier types and formats does it cover? What systems and standards do they embrace? Indonesia used the PAL standard for analogue television. The other systems with global reach were NTSC and CCAM and imported material may be in one of those. You will be using obsolescent or obsolete playback equipment 
and you may need to find additional equipment to complement your present array. And you will need to have staff members who are familiar with how to operate these machines. You may have to go searching for them. They could be people who are currently employed as technicians, but they may also be retired now because skills are generational. The same is true for technicians who know how to service and maintain this old equipment. And again, generational change is constant, so these skills are becoming rare. Current radio and television broadcasters may be able to point you to current or former staff members who have the skills that you need. Spare parts for, some of, for much of this equipment may no longer be available readily. You will need to research available resources, find out are the manufacturers still in business, what can they offer, are there specialist suppliers who can service the archive market, can you get advice and help from other archives. Consider the possibility of outsourcing. There are specialist commercial services service providers who may be able to do what you cannot do. Or perhaps you can share tasks between archives who may have different but complementary capacities to yours. A final option is cannibalization, that is acquiring additional machines which you can use as a source of spare parts. You might need to build something that is uniquely your own to get the job done, build your own monster. <clears throat> 2025 is coming. Migration of the current of the content of analog magnetic tapes to digital files is essential for its survival for two reasons. The carrier has a limited life and the technology required to reproduce the content is obsolete and no longer manufactured. Further, the skills required to operate and maintain such equipment are disappearing. It is generally accepted in the profession that the year 2025, and that's just four years away, represents the end of certainty for the survival of analog content. And archives around the world are working to this deadline. It does not mean that in 2026 all the remaining magnetic tapes suddenly become unplayable or that they magically self-destruct. But it does mean that their chances of survival through migration decline much more rapidly. In terms of explaining the task publicly a stated deadline makes it much more meaningful because that's simply the way we are all hardwired to think. In analog to digital transfer, there will be some inevitable loss of information of picture and sound quality. Your objective is to absolutely minimize that loss and ensure that the method used is lossless not lossy 
using compression algorithms to save storage space is very short-sighted and the lost information can never be retrieved. <clears throat> Curatorial priorities. A favourite quote of mine is this one, digital information lasts forever or five years, whichever comes first. So in setting up a digitization program, you will need to make some choices. <clears throat> Do you digitize every tape or leave some out? What order of priority do you create in your copying queue? Do you copy every tape? Well, based on your selection policy, you may decide that some tapes you had acquired in the past no longer merit digital preservation on the basis of their content. This should be a considered decision because any tapes you do not copy will eventually become unplayable, either because of their condition or because the technology is no longer available. Priority order. You will need to balance several considerations. Do you copy the tapes in poorest condition first? Do you prioritize according to perceived access demand? If some tapes have greater heritage, heritage significance than others, do you attend to these first? And you will need to weigh up how the available skills and resources and funding constraints match your priorities. Do you keep the tapes after digitization? As a general archival principle, yes, if they are still viable and in good condition. Just in case you discover the migration process was poor and a better opportunity offers later. Because no copy will ever contain more information than the original. This principle has to be held in tension with other realities, such as available storage space, and some carriers might be identified for permanent retention because of their artefact value. And in some cases, such as when you treat a tape with sticky shed syndrome by baking it, you might only get one chance anyway to make a copy before the tape becomes unplayable. Once you have digitized a file, ongoing migration every few years is essential. Now your collection is forevermore on life support. You cannot copy and forget. For example, the reliable life of a solid state hard drive can be as little as five years. Digital to digital migration is, in principle, lossless unless some other factor, like lossy compression, is introduced into the process.
Assuming you don't already have sufficient funds to undertake your digitisation project, you'll have to raise them if you're going to complete it. Fundraising and advocacy are large subjects which could take up an entire workshop in their own right. But let's briefly dip into them. You have to prepare the ground for your project. So how do you go about it? Here are some suggestions. You need to be very clear about the scale of your project. About the resources it will need. What it will achieve. And what will be the consequences of failure. You can invoke international reference points, such as the ones I listed at the beginning of the presentation. Um, these include several from UNESCO. And you can invoke these as justification. Document them, include them in your proposal. And back it up with factual data, consultants' reports, or presentations. You need to be clear about your target funding sources. Is it government, philanthropic organisations, commercial sponsors, the general public, partnerships, all of the above? Your message in your case needs to be crafted appropriately. Pursue due process. The legislature, response to formal inquiries, one-on-one -on -one lobbying. If the situation calls for it, design a publicity campaign. There are many communication avenues open to you. The press, radio and television, Articles, statements, releases, position papers, letters, petitions. You can supplement this with events, such as conferences, lectures, show and tell demonstrations, so that the issues are understood. Social media allows instant discussion and networking. And once the project starts, regular updates through these channels is a way of maintaining interest and raising public awareness. Show both material that has been saved and material that is still at risk. And remember, the loss of moving images and recorded sounds is an emotive subject. Does all that advocacy work? Uh, yes, it works. But it can take persistence and a bit of courage. Uh, these links are two examples that you can uh, check out. For example, the National Film and Sound Archive in Australia did this by internal lobbying within government. The National Archives of Australia did it by a public campaign. So with that, thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, 
thank you very much Ray for untuk penjelasan Anda uh, ini sangat menarik sekali bahwa bahwa dalam melakukan preservasi terutama ya secara umum memang konsep preservasi ini memang dalam rangka untuk jangka panjang dan ini uh, yang memang perlu penting untuk digarisbawahi uh, terkait dengan preservasi ini uh, perlu manajemen yang tepat kemudian juga tadi yang disinggung adalah tentang advokasi dan juga pendanaan uh, ini juga salah satu isu yang menarik dan satu lagi adalah terkait dengan deadline 2025 ini juga merupakan salah satu yang menjadikan perhatian kita bersama karena memang dalam uh, melakukan preservasi audiovisual terutama tab magnetik ini uh, sangat penting sekali untuk kita segera menyelamatkan artinya memang dijelaskan di 2025 itu target migrasi dari analog ke digital telah selesai dilakukan karena kondisi fisik dari arsip analog yang semakin rusak dan teknologi uh, alat pemutarnya yang sudah semakin Uh, apa sulit untuk diketemukan. Nah ini uh, perlu strategi. Nah uh, ini sangat selaras sekali dengan materi selanjutnya yang nanti akan disampaikan oleh Mick Mick Newham. Ya kita akan menuju ke narasumber kedua. Uh, sebelum Mick menyampaikan paparannya, uh, narasumber kita uh, pada kali ini adalah Mr. Mick Newham. Saya akan bacakan biodatanya. Uh, Mr. Mick uh, bekerja di National Film and Sound Archive dari tahun 1998 sampai 2017 sebagai Manager of Conservation Services dan juga banyak sekali kontribusi dalam riset dan penanganan masalah pada konservasi dan termasuk untuk long term preservation as visual. Ray juga pernah terpilih sebagai Presiden Siapafa pada 2014 sampai 2017 dan juga pernah menjadi representasi siapa apa pada event CCAA dan bekerja di uh, uh, Federasi Film Archive FIAF ya kemudian juga pernah menjadi preservation committee pada AMIA dan juga pada organisasi uh, ISO. Nah, pada paparan Mick nanti akan menyampaikan terkait dengan persiapan untuk apa migrasi ke digital dan juga digitalisasi agar nantinya bisa diakses karena pelestarian arsip audiovisual itu ke depan lebih banyak untuk penyelamatan ke arah digital. Karena preservasi dan akses itu adalah dua hal yang saling berkaitan uh, preservasi dan akses itu adalah dua sisi koin yang berpasangan yang saling melengkapi uh, karena itu penting sekali kita untuk menekankan pada preservasi dan juga uh, untuk kebutuhan akses uh, selanjutnya dan dalam akses ini juga nanti akan membahas tentang mass storage ya penyimpanan uh, digital kemudian terkait digital asset management quality checking format dan juga public akses nah nanti untuk detailnya kami persilakan uh, Mick Newham untuk menyampaikan paparannya. Waktunya 60 menit. Ya, time is yours. Well, good morning everybody. I'll just try and get my shared screen up. Uh, where are we? Okay, <clears throat> well, I'm going to follow on from Ray Edmondson and talk a little bit about preservation because it's important, uh, but mostly I will be talking about the accessibility of the content once it has been digitized. So <clears throat> you will find a lot of what I say may repeat some of the information that Ray has already given you, um, but I might come at it from a slightly different angle or emphasize other parts of it. <clears throat> um, 
because preservation and access are such, in terms of the digital world, are such huge topics, you know, there's, there is so much to know about it all, that um, <clears throat> sometimes coming from slightly different angles helps clarify it for you. I'm certainly very happy to answer any questions that you may have as the talk goes on. So let's get started. <clears throat> um, I'll just look at the basic or the, the basic factors to consider in a digitization project, the sort of things that you need to, to, to think about and have as part of your plan. Obviously, to begin with, you need what we call infrastructure. These are things like, where do we do it? The accommodation. Then you need what we call clean power. Now, <clears throat> ideally, what comes out of the power point should be 240 volts or 110 volts, wherever you are in the world, depending. But mostly you will find that those voltages will fluctuate. Um, <clears throat> I once had an experience where I was working and we measured the power that was coming out. It should have been 240 volts, but it was anywhere between 180 volts and 260 volts, and it would fluctuate. Now, these can actually upset computers. They can certainly upset uh, playback devices. So you need some way of making your power clean, which uh, there are stabilizers out there that you, you put into things. Quite often you find that big IT installations will actually have a lot of stabilizers and backup power supplies and things with it. So if you just have a look around and see what other people are doing, uh, that will give you a good idea. The next thing is that the uh, IT system cabling, plain everyday office cable connections, which work perfectly even for large offices. When you start pushing files that are gigabytes and gigabytes in size, multiple gigabytes, even terabytes if we start talking about motion picture film, which we're not today, standard office cabling will not cope. It will cause backlogs, it, it's just a nightmare. So you need some dedicated IT cap cabling capability that can handle the size files that you'll be working with. The next thing you'll need, you'll need somewhere to do quality checking, somewhere to hold the files while you check them, because you will find there will be mistakes made by the digitization system, and these will need to be found before you put those files into your archive. And you'll need somewhere to temporarily store them before you move them into your mass storage. And then, of course, you need mass storage. And we're talking more than terabytes. We're probably talking petabytes at least today. And in the future, we will be talking about exabytes of information. And these are just unimaginably large amounts of um, of information. Finally, we will need a digital asset management system. Now I'll come back and talk a little bit about some of these as we go on. Okay, so now I think Ray has already discussed object selection, which is the technical collection uh, condition of the tapes and the curatorial significance. So we'll leave that one for the time being. Conservation treatments, you'll need to be able to do some way of making sure that the tapes are clean. As Ray said, cleanliness with magnetic materials is absolutely top of the line. You can't have any dirt, any mold on your tapes, otherwise you will not get a good transfer. Now this next thing is shell distortion. Um, cassette formats come in that lovely little box over time, they can twist. If they don't sit properly inside the machine, the tape will not run properly and you will not get a good transfer. So you need to be able to check shell distortion and deal with it. Usually that means putting the tape into another good shell. Um, 
not that hard, but it does take a bit of skill. Uh, and then, of course, there's really important things about wind tension, making sure the tape is correctly wound. Uh, again, if it's not correctly wound, when you put it on the machine to do some copying, the, the change in tension will cause uh, all sorts of problems. In audio, you might call it wow and flutter. Um, in video, it would be just a dropout. If you know, the tape stops suddenly or slows down because there's too much tension in the system, you won't get the head catching the tracks properly. And finally, and certainly in tropical areas, the ability to dry tapes out. Um, <clears throat> Ray used the term baking, but really what we're trying to do here is we're just trying to drive the moisture out of the tape because the moisture is actually the sticky bit. As the binder breaks down, uh, it, it attracts moisture, it absorbs moisture. And the water is actually the sticky bit of the whole problem. So if we can dry the tapes nicely, um, I don't use the term baking, but a lot of people do, um, that drives the moisture out and the tape becomes less sticky and more likely to transfer properly. Um, I'll talk a bit about digitization basics later because it's kind of important to get your head around it. And we'll talk a little bit about um, what's called spatial resolution and temporal. So that's just the actual physical resolution of an object and also the time base resolution um, of the original document. And that becomes important. One of the things we might consider in the temporal resolution was, as Ray suggested, the tape speed for an analog tape. So it was seven or three and three quarters or whatever it was, um, that could be considered the temporal resolution as well. Quality checking and checksums, um, huge. We'll do a little exercise on that as we go through. Now this next thing, format status. Um, that is when you've digitized a file, what do you call it? Is it a preservation file? Then there's this strange thing called a mezzanine, which is kind of halfway between access and preservation, but it has a specific purpose. And then of course you have your access files, which are the ones that you put on the internet or, or however you want to do it. Then we need to think about migration timing. And as Ray said, you know, this is, it's on a roundabout, you're stuck. You're going to have to do it. Uh, so there's things like technology watch. What's the technology doing? Is your file format still current? Is your, um, the media on which you're storing your content still supported technologically. And then the timelines, how you might consider when you want to do these migrations. And then of course, security. And Ray was talking about security for your analog collection, but digital collection security is also incredibly important. And in that we would consider disaster planning, or we consider things like viruses. And we also think about things like piracy and fraud, because these are quite serious issues for archives, uh, as you all see as we work through it. Okay, so let's just think a little bit about a mass storage system. And we need to know what the minimum capacity is that we're going to need. Um, now, it's, it's quite often good to work backwards, I, I think, when you're designing a system. Uh, work out the infrastructure first, work out your mass storage system, um, your cabling, all the way through. Then at the very end of it, you can get to your digitizers and things like that. Now, many projects fall or fail to, to, to deliver by purchasing the actual digitization equipment before they've got everything else in place. And that, that can uh, cause a few problems, um, such as until you've actually got the rest of it in place, you can't test the machines and make sure they're going to work properly. Um, and also things like your warranty on the machine, you know, your, the guarantee that the machine is going to be supported for 12 months or five years or whatever it is that the contract has created. Um, that's being wasted if the machine is just sitting there. Our digitization equipment is very front page newsworthy uh, and perhaps cabling isn't 
but cabling is really, really important. So it's good to get these sorts of things in, in place to begin with. Okay, so when you're also thinking about storage, of course, we're thinking about the minimum capacity and it's possible to work out roughly how much storage you're going to need based on your collection. And if you know how you're going to digitize it, the parameters, which we can talk about later, um, that will give you an idea of what you're going to need. But you are going to need multiple copies uh, because all your eggs in one basket is a bad idea. Also in your, um, your mass storage system, you need to think about how long it takes you to access a file. Now, data tape is a very, very efficient, cost-effective way of storing large amounts of digital data, but it does have a, a cost in terms of time. Uh, it won't be necessarily instantly available. It might take seconds, might take minutes, and depending on how you've done your mass storage system, it might even take days to, to retrieve the right tape, put it in the machine, work out where the file is you want. One thing that I, I do think is important is that you actually have separate systems for preservation and access. And I've got a little diagram to look at that a little bit later. Your mass storage needs to be secure. So that means no one can get into it apart from those people who are authorized to. And again, the little diagram I've got will show that. A quarantine system for anything that you're putting into your mass storage, just to make sure that no nasty viruses go in there and, and start corrupting all your, your collection. Um, and then there are, are a couple of ways of thinking about how do we want to, to buy this mass storage, uh, cost per terabyte per year. Now, there are a few things that you might want to put down underneath this. So if you want to do it all in-house, then you would look at the net lettable area, you know, the, the rent that you'll be paying per square metre, the initial hardware cost, depreciation, maintenance, licensing, electricity, staff costs, hardware upgrades, those sorts of things, and software upgrades, of course. The other one that is suitable for some collections um, is cloud storage, which is very popular. And again, <clears throat> you have upload costs, you have download costs. So what does it cost to get it from your digitization system up into the cloud? And then again, when you want that file back, what does it cost to get it back down again in terms of, I don't know, dollars per gigabyte or, or however it's worked, worked out. Um, and then you also need to see what is covered in your cloud storage contract. It's what's called a service level agreement. Now, cloud cost can be very expensive per terabyte. And you look at it and you go, oh my goodness, you know, this, is, this is a huge amount of money. But in the service level agreement, they may talk about doing all the preservation work. So that means multiple copies. It means data checking. It means all the good stuff that needs to be done to keep your files intact. So um, we might just leave that one there and we'll just move on to the next, next component, mindful of time. Okay, this is a really important thing. This is the way that you organize your files in your storage system. It's a digital asset management system. Sometimes they're called a media asset management system, but regardless, it's all the same thing. It is in fact a virtual library inside your storage system. It's a centralized digital library, but it's a very, very efficient library. It's very good at organizing and knowing where it's put things and being able to retrieve things. There's a lot of workflow automation that can also go on in a digital asset management system. It can do checking of, of your files to make sure that they're still good, that there haven't been any changes. And whilst, yes, we acknowledge that a digital file is a digital file is a digital file, things can change over time. Um, it's just in the laws of nature and the laws of thermodynamics. These things can happen. Uh, a few years ago, there was a fashionable term called bit flipping, when a one became a zero or a zero became a one, or a whole block would somehow change for some way. 
Um, so having some sort of checking system, some automated checking system is really good. Digital asset management system may also take care of some of the archiving tasks, uh, such as creating backups and so forth. And also very, very importantly, it will look at how the files are being used. And this becomes important. And I've got a little discussion about this right towards the end of, of my talk today. So a digital asset management system is, is, is crucial. Um, yes, you could do it manually, but wow. <laughs> That's a lot of work to do, and you probably couldn't do it as well. This thing is working for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So it's, 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 it's just a crucial. You really can't imagine a digital archive without a proper digital asset management system installed and managing your collection. There are many, <coughs> excuse me, there are many, many different products on the market. Um, you basically have to choose one where you, you get good, um, it, it, it will handle the demands that your system will put on it, and it'll have support. Uh, there are an awful lot of people out there that are, are selling systems, and they sound great, but without support, um, you're really just buying into a bit of, bit of a problem because uh, they're very complex to set up. They're very complex to sort of get people trained in. But once they're up and running, uh, they still need support. They still need updates. They still need maintenance. So your support for a digital asset management system is really important. Let's move on. Okay, so let's just think a little bit about the digitization basics. Um, there are two, two key things to think about when we're talking about digitizing. One is called quantization. Now, I've put this sort of going up the axis, uh, sorry, up the um, axes. Quantization is really just how many levels you decide to chop your waveform or your signal up into. If you chop it into two, eh, you'll get pretty rough results. If you chop it into a million, you'll probably find that there's more information than a system can manage. So it nearly needs to be chopped up into a manageable amount, um, manageable for the computer. And don't forget, computers are actually very good at managing numbers. So the more, not, the more levels you've got, the, um, the more accurately you have represented the original curve. Okay, or the original shape of the waveform. And that's really what we want to do. So we want to have enough levels that we can recreate that waveform to a good enough standard, but not too many that we can't actually manage the size of the file at the end of it. Now, the other half of thinking about this digitization is what's called sampling times or the number of times per second we work out what's happening with that particular waveform or that, that signal. Um, <clears throat> and again, more the better. Um, the greater uh, the quantization, uh, oh, sorry, let's just run back a little bit. Um, sampling is the, um, the number of times per second that you, you would actually take that little snapshot. So you take a snapshot and one part of the snapshot is the time and the other part is exactly what is the level of the signal at that point in time. And that's one little piece of information. And then the next sample comes along and it's the time and the exact level of the waveform at that point in time. And that's the second piece of information. And it does that an awful lot of times. Um, times per second is called Hertz, named after a gentleman who thought about it. Audio files use kilohertz or thousands of times per second. Okay, so we're starting to talk about some really big numbers here already. Now, video uses megahertz or millions of times per, section, per second, as there is so much more information to gather. Um, although it talk about megahertz, we tend to think about video digitization in kilobits per second, because it's just an easier number for us to think about. Um, and of course, 
the more kilobits per second we have, the better it is. So that means the more, or the, the finer the quantization, the better. Um, and the more sample times, the better, up to a point. Um, <clears throat> I'll sh show you what I mean here. In audio preservation, um, the standard for a mono track, so this is what we're talking about, a mono track, is 24 bit, which is 16,777,000 odd um, levels that we're going to chop our signal, our signal up into. I told you we're talking about some big numbers here. Um, and we sample that for our preservation standard or a generally accepted preservation standard at 96 kilohertz. That's 96,000 times a second. So we have a huge amount of information that we have to deal with. Um, <clears throat> So for a mono track, we're talking about uh, 2,304 kilobits per second. And if we're talking about stereo track, we double that. So that's what, 4,608, something like that. Thinking back to our storage requirement, if we're thinking about analog video and how we ten generally tend to uh, um, want to digitize our analog video, we're talking about 105 gigabytes of storage per hour of uncompressed analog video. Now that's a single copy. Now we want multiple copies. So you can see whilst we can start doing some sums as to how much storage we're going to need, we're going to end up needing an awful lot of storage, which is why we also need a digital asset management system that help us keep things under control. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Once we have digitized our files, we have the whole quality checking and a thing called checksums. Now quality checking, I think you can understand. It's, does, does the audio sound good? Are, are there any missing bits? Is there a lot of noise? You know, crackly stuff that shouldn't have been in there, wasn't in the original, but now has found its way into the, um, into the copy, which is a good thing. So rigorous quality checking for errors. Um, now, a lot of digitization systems uh, will actually track errors during digitization and will create a report at the end, which is very nice. Um, it's nice to be told, yes, it didn't work. So you can go back and perhaps have another go at it, do it a bit better. Now comes something which I think is super important in uh, managing a digital collection of, 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 any, of anything. And that's a creature called a checksum. Now I've got the little uh, definition here, which I pulled off Google, so it must be true. And a checksum is a digit representing the sum of the correct digits in a piece of stored or transmitted digital data against which later comparisons can be made. Um, so what it really does, a checksum is just a little, a little bit of software that adds up all the ones and zeros, believe it or not, in a file. And it comes up with a number, it's mathematical. It comes up with a number and it gives that number a code. That's code is then an important piece of the metadata that Ray was talking about of your file. You need to hold on to that because that is your benchmark. Now, if you're happy with your file, you give it a checksum and that checksum becomes part of the metadata. So every time you do something with that file, like you move it from one server to another or whatever, um, you can use that number to check what it should be. And then you check the file after you've done whatever it is you're going to do to it. And as long as those two numbers line up, you know your file hasn't been corrupted and it's still good. So <clears throat> what I'm gonna try and um, do now, hopefully this will work. I wanna show you how a checksum works. So, Fingers crossed this all works. It worked when I tried it earlier. 
Okay, yes, we know that. Uh, let's browse for a file. Okay, uh, make sure I get the right file. I think that's the good one. Okay, now, is that box showing up on the screens out there? Anyone can just sort of wave if there's a, hopefully you can see what I've done. There is a number given in this down here, the current file MD5 checksum value. Is that visible? Ray, can you nod your head if it's visible? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we were happy with the file. We put it into our little, little bit of software. It's a tiny little bit of software. Um, and it's added up all the numbers and it's given us this, this thing here. So, um, I think we can do this, control C, uh, control V, oh, sorry. Uh, should have done that. Okay, now let's try a file which we know has a little bit of a problem. And hopefully you can see it's an entirely different number. Okay, so the first one started with 8D, and then the number nine, and the good file was C82. So we can see that the second file, there was a problem. It doesn't match the original. So I'll just get rid of that. And hopefully you can see on the screen, if I sort of wave my pointer around, you can see there's a dropout. The video dropout has occurred on the second image. And that's what upset the MD5 system, it, it said, no, no, that information isn't the same, that's different. And so we've picked it up before um, the problem becomes an even bigger problem. Okay, so now let's move on a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> compression and format status. And we, we, we are working up to, um, to access, I can assure you, but we're still going through the whole digitization setup, how we make our choices for, for what we put into our digitization setup. So we'll talk about compression and Ray spoke about um, lossless and lossy. And so we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about format status. So, <coughs> excuse me again, our preservation file is the highest possible resolution. That's all those amazing 16,777,000 um, odd levels that we've chopped our file up into going one way and the 96,000 um, samples per second that we've done on our time base for, for an audio track. So we want high resolution and we want no compression or there is an option, a thing called um, lossless compression. Now, lossless compression is, it's kind of okay, because what it does, it's a, it's a mathematical and a statistical analysis of the ones and zeros. It's not looking at the content at all. Lossy con compression looks at making the original content simpler to digitize, easier to digitize. And that's where it starts throwing away things that it thinks you don't really need. Um, but in terms of preservation, we do need it. We, we need everything. Uh, we can't afford to throw anything away. It's, it's unethical apart from anything else. Um, okay, so <clears throat> lossless is a purely mathematical system. So we can compress it using lossless compression. And because we've only compressed the data, not the content, there's a difference there, we can actually recover that 100% every time. And you can see why our checksum becomes important now, because the checksum will let us know whether the files match. Okay, when we put it through this loss, less compression format and brought it back out again, it should be 100% or 99.9 .9 recurring percent of the original, hopefully within the parameters of the checksum anyway. So that's preservation. And there are a whole heap of file types that we would use for that, um, that use either no compression or lossless. <clears throat> then we have mezzanine, which is high resolution. 
So it's got all the original information in it, you know, that, that we would want. But this one we can actually put some compression into because it's it's not our preservation. It's going to be used uh, as part of the whole duplication process for new content or something like that. Um, ProRes is an example of this uh, in Final Cut Pro. Video editors, they love ProRes. It's compressed format, but it, it's kind of compressed in a very clever way, so it doesn't look too terrible at the end of it. But it's not a preservation format because it does throw things away. But the things that it throws away are less important, perhaps, to the final outlook. OK, <coughs> so then, sorry. Then we come to access. Now, these are low resolution, low bandwidth. So that means they, they're very small files, which means they're throwing stuff away. They're, they're designed to be small. And the only way you can really make these things small is to throw stuff away. Now, what I've got here are two samples of, a, of the same, same part of the file. One I've used completely uncompressed WAV, um, WAV file. And this is our preservation file. And on the other side, hopefully you can see it, I've got all the little pictures sort of dotted down the screen on that side there. But you can see I've drawn a red line down at the two, um, 20,000 hertz mark, the 20K line. And if you look at the WAV and then you look at the MP3, you can see exactly what's been thrown away. All that top end, that's really high frequency information has just gone. There are some other issues as well. If you look at the, the x-axis and you can see that the whole thing has been shifted. And, and so that's all contributed to, to a change in the file and, and loss of information. So there, <clears throat> there we have basically the, the concept of compression and format status. The, the, the higher the format status, the preservation file, compression is right out of it. We do not want compression in, in, in that. Or if we do have compression, it is what's called lossless, where it's a mathematical, um, a mathematical calculation on the data, the digitized data, the ones and zeros. Whereas lossy would look at the original signal and say, well, the high frequency stuff uses big numbers. We don't want that. We don't want big numbers because that's difficult to digitize. That makes a lot of, lot of expense in terms of, of data. So it throws it away because it may not be important. You know, we may not notice it, but in a preservation file, we do notice it. Okay, then there's the mezzanine, which is the sort of the, the I suppose you call it a copying, a copying step, and then access, which is the, it's kind of like the VHS used to be. You know, you, you had a, a motion picture film on 35 millimeter on the big screen. It was beautiful. It was fantastic. But then for a lot of access to that image or for that, that picture, they'd be quite happy to put it on a VHS cassette. And there's a huge difference between a VHS and motion picture projected on a big screen. I think you can agree with that. Um, so we're talking about low resolution, low bandwidth. Okay, let's move on. Um, here I wanted to talk about the migration and how we might consider that we migrate and our timeline, how we might start thinking about this. And, and Ray went and discussed this a little bit. I'm going to discuss it a bit more because I want to include the whole concept of where we put the checksums. So we start off with a file or in terms of preservation, we have three files. First thing we would look at is the format. What's, what's the format of the file and the media that it's stored on and how, how well supported that is. Is it still current? Um, if it's not, then we need to duplicate or transcode the file. Once we've done that, we do a quality check. And once we're happy with the quality, we put a checksum in. Because we've changed some of the metadata around, around the file, we actually have to update our metadata that goes with that file. This is the information about the information, so to speak. Then we, what we call ingest, which puts it into the server, into our digital asset management system or our media asset management system. Once it's in there, we check it again. We check that checksum and make sure that nothing has happened between this quality check stage and it actually sitting inside our server. 
Now, because we've got a new file inside our server, we update our database to make sure that we know that it's the most current form. And so there's a whole heap more sort of metadata that gets updated there. And then we're back to where we started from. And we check the currency of the format and the media and so on and so on and so on. Of course, if we have a problem here, if our uh, asset management system picks up that there's a problem, then we can skip this bit here and we just go straight to duplicate and transcode to make sure that we actually have the best possible quality uh, check. Sorry, best possible quality, which we then check and add through that way. So it's, <clears throat> it's the roundabout and you're stuck with it. There's nothing you can do about it. To a certain extent, this is analogous to the problem that we had with analog media. If you can imagine two inch videotape, as soon as that was not supported, we had to duplicate it onto a new format quality check. We didn't have checksums back then, but we just had to do it by eye and hope for the best. But of course, we had to update the media because it was on two inch, it's now on one inch, or it was on BVU, three quarter inch, whatever you want to call it, um, which we then put back into our collection, which is analogous to ingesting. We had to update our database and then come back round the format and we say, well, one inch is no longer supported or three quarter inch is no longer supported. What are we going to do? We'll move it to beta cam or whatever. So there are some analogies there, um, just it becomes a lot more pressing and a lot more urgent to get it right when we're talking about digital. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll just briefly touch on the security. This is the diagram I said we would talk about. This is kind of what's happening inside our system. Okay, so we have the original object, we digitize it, create metadata, we check sum it, we verify it, and we end up with three files, three preservation files, because that's really important. And we verify those. We then create our access files, and we move that outside into a separate server. So this is only a one-way travel from inside our system to our access server. And that means that basically there's no way that people can get from the web or whatever and hack into this system here because this is only a one-way link. Likewise, if we have an external file that we're bringing in, and don't forget that once, once our collection is digitized, it's not just going to be the videotape, the audio tape that was in our collection. We're going to be bringing in new born digital content into our collection as well. So external files need to go into quarantine and they're there for a couple of weeks. And what we're doing in that quarantine period is we're letting all the clever people out there in the world who know about such things, working out what viruses are new and working out ways of vaccinating against them, I guess is the best way to think about it. So, we, so that just gives us buy some time to make sure that anything that we now put into our digital collection is clean. It's not going to cause the whole system to fall apart at the seams and lose everything, which could very easily happen. Okay, so that's really important. And this is the section I like here is to keep the access server quite different to your mass storage system and have no back chat, basically. So things can only move from here to there. They can't, nothing can really talk back again the other way. Okay, right, now we get onto access, which is probably what you've all been waiting for. I'll, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, just give the poor old translators a rest just for a few moments, because I'm sure they're working overtime with Australian accents. Okay, so we know what we want with access. We want our files, the content rather, of our collection to go where it's needed, to go where people are, want to see it, to go where you want people to see it. Okay, so that's really what access is all about. Um, there's a little definition that, that I quite like. I, I hope it translates into Indonesian reasonably well. And it basically says that preservation without access is called 
hoarding. In other words, you're just holding it on and keeping it to yourself. And that's not what the archives are about. Archives are about making sure that information remains accessible. Now, there can be restrictions on that access for all sorts of legal reasons, um, but basically it is accessible if you have the right to access it, okay? And I'll talk about some examples about this perhaps as we, we go through. Okay, so here are the basics again, the basic factors that we want to consider when we're talking about access. Intellectual property management. This is, this is copyright, basically. Now there's legal obligations. We all know about that. There's the, um, whatever they call themselves, the World uh, Intellectual Property Organization, the international covenants covering all these sorts of things. And basically, if people get access to something that they don't have a right to, it's an infringement or maybe an infringement on copyright, and there are strict penalties involved around that. Now, there are also, <coughs> in some areas, what you might call non-legal consequences. And this, this could be uh, what you might consider moral rights or objections. When I talk about this in Australia, I talk particularly about uh, Indigenous Australians who have very strong cultural beliefs that need to be respected. Now, unfortunately, there is no law. In fact, I don't think there are any laws anywhere in the world that actually protect what's called ICIP or Indigenous, in, sorry, Indigenous Cultural Intellectual Property. Now, this is, this is intellectual property just as much as a Disney film or anything like that. It is intellectual property. It's just the way that the legal systems throughout the world have decided <clears throat> they can manage ownership. Ownership can only exist in uh, a single entity. Whereas if you have a group of people who have a communal ownership, that's not considered a single entity under the law, and it's a problem. However, if your organisation just starts to hand out um, this uh, content, which is very, very important to some people for all sorts of cultural reasons, and that this, this knowledge should not be shared outside that particular cultural group, um, it can bring the organisation into disrepute and, and quite strong disrepute, which will have impacts in the future for the way you can collect information or who you can collect information from. And it's about trust. Now, archives really rely heavily on trust. We go through all this. We go through all this incredibly complex and expensive preservation work so people can trust what we do. If you then lose trust for whatever reason, it can, it can have an impact back on your organisation into the future. So it's always good just to keep this in the back of your mind that the, even though there may not be a legal imperative, it's always good to be fully aware of any, any moral rights that may be, exist around any of the content that you want to provide access to. Um, certainly in Indigenous Australia, there is information which should not be seen even by people within that particular cultural group. It should only be seen by, by the elders, the, 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 um, the people responsible for the um, maintenance of the cultural knowledge. So, so non-legal consequences, hard to explain, but they do exist and you do have to be a bit wary about it. Okay, so other ways that we can deal with our intellectual property is watermarking, which we can put something on the actual image or into the file to make sure that it's, it's acknowledged as where it came from. And then we need piracy and fraud control. And Ray spoke about this in terms of only authorized people were allowed to sort of get into your collection. Uh, okay, so let's move on just quickly, access formats the degree of compression and the delivery method, will it be online, offline? Um, online is obviously the web. Offline could be 
you just put something onto a, a, a USB stick or a drive and you actually physically move it to someone. Um, <clears throat> which you might do with a very, very big file, like a, a big video file or something like that, which would just take days to download. Um, <clears throat> okay, so system bandwidth, uh, how much your internal infrastructure and uh, the anticipated network capacity. Now, the network I'm thinking of here is the national network. So if you've got a broadband system, what can the broadband manage, especially out to some of the more uh, remote areas? You know, do they have um, 100 megabits a second or do they have 12 megabits a second? And those are the sorts of things you need to think about. So when you're thinking about having some access files, you might need to have them in several um, flavors, if you like, of, of various bit rates, just to so that the people in the more remote regions can still gain access without having to wait for buffering and all sorts of things. Um, okay, uh, delivery, there's kind of push, which is like the old broadcast model where a TV station would push and you had to sit there and watch it at a certain time. Uh, then there's on demand, uh, such as a straight download. So it just pulls the file off, off your server, or there's a streaming service like YouTube, where, where the file is actually sent out a little bit at a time. And then access statistics and advocacy, which is the justification and ongoing support for what it is you're doing. Very important. Okay, so here we go. The, um, uh, where are we up to? Oh, here we go. Actually, we've discussed this in a fair, fair amount of detail already. So we have WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization. We have international agreements, non-legal, uh, moral rights, spiritual rights. Now, I did say there's no law protecting ICIP, Indigenous Cultural Intellectual Property, but there are various UNESCO, um, oh, I've got to get the terminology right. <laughs> there's declarations and there's conventions and things like that. Um, and, and there are conventions or declarations, I forget which, uh, from UNESCO that countries sign up to in just about every country in the world, except a couple of notable ones like Australia, um, have signed up to, to, to try and protect Indigenous intellectual property. And then there's the whole idea of um, contractual arrangements with the owners. Now, if you're a national archive and you're basically just dealing with government type stuff, well, that's probably not too hard because there will be various layer, layers of accessibility written into every document that you receive. Um, but if it's material coming in from outside, then someone will need to be responsible to say, yes, this can be accessed freely, or this can be accessed with permissions, or this can only be accessed by paying money. Um, some organisations don't clear the copyright, but they insist that the person requesting access clears the copyright with the owner. Um, <clears throat> and then they somehow prove to the, uh, <laughs> to the archive, yes, the owner says it's okay. Look, I've got this email from him saying it's all good. Thank you very much. So we can do it that way. Access formats. Okay, so <clears throat> we're just talking purely access here no preservation. So let's start at the bottom, web browsing. So we're talking about really high compression. We're talking about very low bit rate. This might be the things that the people out in the regional areas, the remote areas with poor internet connectivity, they're the files that they will best appreciate. It will not be as good a quality as perhaps others may get who have more access to digital, uh, to, to um, Good quality internet, but they'll still get something at least. Okay, so let me move up a bit. This is the high quality browsing. Now you've probably seen this in YouTube and, and you might have some options for, for various files that you can access. So it starts off at the very low compression rates and then it goes higher and higher. So we would use a medium or maybe even a lossless compression if we're talking about audio. If we, given that a lot of broadband systems are actually very capable. They can, they can pretty much deal with uncompressed um, 
files for certainly for audio not not so much for for video perhaps but certainly for audio now this would not be necessarily streaming this could be a download um, <clears throat> So we're talking about a moderate bit rate here. We're talking about something that we would really need broadband to be able to deal with. <coughs> and then we come to this, this funny mezzanine thing. Now, I'm not the world's biggest fan of having a mezzanine file, um, mainly because formats change so regularly that I think it's probably best that if you do get a request for a mezzanine type file, is that you go back to the preservation master and you create exactly what the client wants rather than just creating a, a mezzanine file and hoping that's what the client wants. Um, yes, it takes a little bit more effort, um, but it uses a lot less storage. Um, <coughs> excuse me again. Uh, but at least they're, they're, they're going to get exactly what they want. Um, and it's kind of an unspoken fact that 95% of a collection will never be accessed. How's that for a terrible fact? I mean, we're keeping all this wonderful stuff and most of it will never be accessed. But uh, when it is accessed, we want to make sure that people get the right access, the best possible quality access. So let's move on and see what some of these things might be. <clears throat> okay, so for audio, uh, low bitrate browsing, we've got good old MP3, which unfortunately is now an obsolete format. It hasn't been supported for a number of years, but there is just so much MP3 stuff out there and so many players that will access it. People are still creating MP3, but the actual technological support that was developing it and keeping it going has now stopped. Uh, we have MP4, uh, MP4A, which are newer formats. Um, MP4 is, you might recognize as a video file as well. Uh, just the audio layer that comes off an MPEG file. Uh, 3GP, which is what's very popularly used for um, mobile phones, and this thing called OG, which most people have never heard of, but it's actually quite good. For your high quality browsing, when you can put your MP3 and you just increase the bit rate. So instead of at a 128, it's 320 kilobits a second or something like that. It makes quite a bit of difference. Then you've got MP4 for a 3GP again, OG. Now you can also have WAV. You can put some compression into WAV, um, which, it, which would be fine. Then if you're going to create a mezzanine file, then perhaps WAV, sometimes it's BWF, which is WAV with a bit more metadata and FLAC, which is actually quite a good uh, format as well. For video, again, you've got pretty much you know, the, the old favorites. You've got MP4, which is also called H.264. Then you have this newer format, H.265, which is um, slowly replacing 264. Um, sometimes it's called high efficiency or high, high video encoding, something or other efficiency coding, high video efficiency coding, something like that anyway. And then you've got 3GP, which is a very versatile format. Because remember we said it was also an audio format. For your high quality um, browsing, the, you tend to just drop that back to MP4 or the H.265. Mezzanine level, <coughs> well, MOV, which is the ProRes format, it's very popular. Um, JPEG 2000, and it's one of its lossless formats is, is quite good. And this FFmpeg one, uh, FFV1, uh, which is FFmpeg, which is a gaining a lot of popularity for all sorts of things, in, including um, preservation in one of its uh, flavors. Okay, so let's look at the system bandwidth. Um, when we're thinking about our servers, we need to think of the capacity to deliver. You know, that's the, um, how big is the pipe that we can put things out through and the number of ports. So the number of, uh, of discrete Way, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Trails, perhaps, or lines? The, the, just the number of um, requests that we can service at, at, at any one time. Then you have your internet connection, which is the size of the pipe from your internal system to the big wide world of the wide web. <clears throat> that goes without saying, it's really being important. 
And then we talk about our predicted network speed. So average speed over the internet, um, will people get the files that they want in a reasonable amount of time or will they have to wait far too long? Okay, now there, there are two ways again that we can kind of think of how we are going to provide access. One is push. And like I said, this is analogous to the original TV broadcast style of doing things. Uh, it uses curatorial input from your organization and there's very limited interactivity. So for example, uh, um, well, what's happening today? Um, this is a push system. You know, it's happening in real time, it's pushing out. People don't really have the opportunity to sort of run forward, run back uh, over what we've been doing this morning. Um, so it, it, it's very much one way traffic. Then we have two ways, as I said, there's download and there's streaming. Download is they download the whole file and uh, they can have a timer on it that permits a single play or a date by which the, um, the file is no longer workable or streaming, which sends data out in packets at a rate that will permit um, uninterrupted or as close to uninterrupted as possible. So you don't get that horrible little buffering logo that sort of annoys the annoys you very much when you're trying to watch a, a movie or something on, on, on the internet. And this, of course, depends on the, the speed of the internet. Now, it may be cost effective to, to outsource at this point. Whatever you do in terms of this delivery, this, this sort of pull model, if you will, the issues are discoverability. Um, how easily can people find what they want? So this is high quality metadata, you know, the, the searchability of your asset of your access server uh, management system, um, how quickly people can find what they want based on metadata searches. And you can also still nudge people along to things that you think they might be interested in. And again, this is one of the things that perhaps YouTube does. It comes up as like recommendations, those sorts of things. So it's still completely interactive, but you're actually pushing people a little bit in the direction you want to go. So I've got about one minute left or two minutes left. <laughs> um, and finally, statistics. I, I and just advocacy. want to remind her for five minutes again. Sorry. <laughs> yep, got that, Danny. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have, it's really important that we keep statistics regarding our, our access requests because this, this is how you demonstrate to the people that have the money to keep you going that yes, what you're doing is really worthwhile, okay? So whatever you do, you need to keep those access statistics as accurate and as up-to-date as possible. And it also helps you understand what people are interested in. So you can actually feed that back into the digitization um, prioritizations within your collection. So if you find that a lot of people are really interested in surfing movies or surfing information, then you can look through and say, okay, well, we've got all this stuff that we were going to talk about with surfing, and um, but it wasn't very high on our priority list, but people seem to want it. So we can move that up the priority and start satisfying the demand. And when you satisfy demand, people are happy, which is good advocacy for your organization. Uh, so by getting the marketing right um, upstream, um, for upstream, I'd be basically talking about the bosses, making sure they're happy that, that what you're doing is, is value for money. And by encouraging more users, um, by demonstrating the viability, because you've got lots of users, the bosses are happy again. So I think that's my allocated time within a second or two. <laughs> so I will stop sharing my screen and hopefully I will come back to the real world. And uh, I guess if anyone's got any questions, uh, perhaps the moderator can point them in our direction. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Mick. Tadi sangat menarik sekali. Uh, banyak menjelaskan tentang akses terkait dengan kekayaan intelektual, format akses, ya kemudian banyak sekali juga tadi tentang uh, storage dan sistem bandwidth dan ini sebenarnya juga menjadi kendala kita di 
di negara-negara dengan uh, apa namanya pendanaan yang terbatas maupun uh, beberapa fasilitas juga yang uh, kita uh, tidak apa namanya kurang ya atau mungkin uh, beberapa fasilitas yang terbatas bahwa tentang aksesibilitas uh, konten ini memang dalam preservasi digital itu memang hal yang sangat penting dan itu menjadi salah satu penunjang untuk melakukan preservasi digital dan bagaimana kita untuk mengakselerasi akses ini uh, penting sekali untuk me- me- menggunakan beberapa kriteria tadi dalam uh, menyusun sebuah sistem yang uh, nantinya diakses oleh publik secara luas. Ya, uh, kami apresiasi kepada kedua narasumber dan uh, luar biasa dan kita akan lanjutkan pada sesi tanya jawab ya, tanya jawab nanti Uh, perlu saya sampaikan bahwa beberapa pertanyaan sudah masuk cukup banyak di uh, forum chat ya dan juga di question and answer dan juga ada yang masuk di uh, apa YouTube channel di Andri dan kami akan bacakan satu persatu uh, mohon untuk bisa di share screen untuk terkait dengan pertanyaan agar narasumber juga langsung bisa melihat Pertanyaan apa yang disampaikan? Ini yang pertama eh, terkait eh, pertanyaan untuk Mr. Mick Newham. What do you think about the cloud storage security for digitizing archive storage? Ini pertanyaan dari Taufik Nurul Huda dari Andri. Ya, eh, kita akan bacakan tiga pertanyaan pertama, kemudian yang kedua. terkait uh, ini dari Novi Mordianti dari National Library uh, Code Standard Conversion Devices uh, for example merchant standard for HS player for workman and stone video cards and standard application uh, be said that we have digital collection according to uh, international standards we already have storage uh, sta- sun ya yeah, and nas Is the device suitable for storing audiovisual files? For one question again. Uh, yes, this is for Ray Edmondson uh, from Altilda Purworejo in Central Java. What's your advice about how to begin preservation archive in limited facilities? Uh, what your interesting experience during preservation in the ar- uh, for archives? And that's for three first question. Uh, I hope uh, Ray will uh, answer first. And after that, uh, Mick, uh, please you continue. I th- my answer is you start very small um, with what you can do. And and you and you make time, you, you try to build, build in um, time for the future. So, uh, I'm I think of my experience with film originally but with but with tape first of all you you, you need to accumulate your collection um, what is it what is it you want to preserve uh, and and you you begin by having a um, a physical collection stored properly as I mentioned earlier in my presentation and organized um, properly and you uh, you build gradually you select the machinery you want you work to try to increase your budget you have to make a case to people who give you your money if you're part of a government body um, then there's a, a process by which you do that um, but it's also important as soon as you can to provide some some sort of access to your collection um, because it it affirms the value of you being there and the value of you having your archive Um, and once people see what you can do, then you have a better chance of persuading your funding authorities um, to give you money. So, uh, if we go back to the beginnings of um, the archive where Mick and I have both worked, which is the National Film and Sound Archive, originally it was part of the National Library of Australia. That's going back 50 years or so. Um, and the facilities were extremely limited. Uh, even the storage was not very good. But the important thing was to start to make aspects of the collection accessible uh, so people could see the value of what you were doing. And, and gradually, things changed. Mick, could you add to that? 
Um, well, I can't really add to that, but <laughs> I, I always use the case study of, of our friend Bunchao in Laos and the, the establishment of the, the Lao Film Archive and Video Center, or the National Film Archive and, and Video Center in Laos. And they started with almost nothing, I think, <laughs> with Bunchao and one or two others. And not even shelves, not even shelves. Not even shelves. So to begin with, they, they had to work out how to get boxes off the floor um, mm. to give them that first level of protection. And they got bricks and planks from building sites and they mm. built it up from there. And today, I always use the example of the Lao Film Archive because it is one of the most impressive archives in the region today. And it's all done by, as Ray said, building a little bit at a time. You, you can't start off with the Taj Mahal. You, know? no. you have to start off with something small and then you just incrementally build on that. And certainly <clears throat> all the archives that I can think of have all started that way. Um, the trick is not to get disheartened the thing is not to look at the, the, the Library of Congress in America and go, oh, well, that's what it should be. You know, <laughs> it should be what you can what you can achieve. You have the basic principles that you know about and you just work to those principles. Because what you're achieving is more than would happen if you were not doing what you were doing. And in the case yeah. of, of <laughs> Lau, um, an important step for them, and this is a gets into areas of advocacy, um, <clears throat> during a Sipava conference, um, the people from Laos and the people from Vietnam talked to each other and they worked out that they could um, use a mechanism that existed between the two countries where Vietnam provided government to government access to Laos to use the, the, that, that mechanism for Vietnam to fund the building of the Lao building, the archive building. And it was... Um, now, that sounds very simple. It's not simple. Uh, but that was the mechanism. So they met in, a, in a, a mutual place where they could talk about these things, which was a, the Sipava conference. Then they were able to follow it up with, the, with each government to achieve that result. Um, so that's advocate, it's one aspect of advocacy where you're always looking out for opportunities um, to increase your resource base to get someone else to help you. Uh, either with skills or with money or with equipment. Um, and uh, I know that Bunchao did the rounds of the embassies in Vientiane uh, to see if any of them would fund equipment, and he was successful. So these are, this is sort of using your head to see what are the connections that you can, um, you can tap uh, to get resources. And everybody's situation is different. So um, uh, you, you look around and you see which avenues you can try to push. Okay, maybe uh, it's enough from Ray and me. <coughs> okay, yeah. we will continue for the next question. <coughs> Uh, from uh, Rinda Ekasari from Universitas Terbuka Jakarta. Uh, what are the most significant obstacles in the sustainability of the preservation that uh, have been running so far and plans for the future? Okay, oh. well, <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as I think we've, we've said that uh, preservation oh, is roundabout. Also, and then for the next uh, question oh, <laughs> um, from Lala Nur Hidayah from University, Munawarman University, Borneo. So far, yeah. we haven't found any archives of cases or magnetic tape. But in the future, if we do with them, what is the first thing uh, we should do or what steps should we do? Organize your collection. So it's not a big mess. Um, <laughs> yes. Bring some order to it so that you know what you have. Um, and then for the next then, question. Yeah. From Ahmad Didi Fauzi, from Andri, from Mr. Ray. 
could you explain time by step about audiovisual adapt to focus and what complicated as our most uh, extent phone? Okay. Um, well. <laughs> So which is we... yes uh, for that three okay. question please uh, make, uh, to explain first and then after that Ray after that okay okay the um as as both Ray and I have have Still... mentioned yep. the preservation is the roundabout that you that you are stuck you, there's no way off it <laughs> not not if you want to keep your archive going so the sustainability really is that you have the resources to keep the roundabout going and <clears throat> the way that you get those resources is through as Ray and I both <laughs> both agree on very strongly is advocacy demonstrating the value of your organization demonstrating the worth of what it is that you are doing <clears throat> and that is through access um, and it's also through as we might say in Australia happy customers people who um, are happy with, with the way that your organisation has dealt with their request and are willing to basically tell their friends and hopefully eventually word of mouth gets back up to, to the people who have the money and they will keep giving you the money to keep going with your preservation roundabout. Um, <clears throat> the sustainability issue is that it doesn't get cheaper to do it because at a certain point, you're going to have to do some fairly major migrations, which are very expensive in terms of time, materials, people, and things like that. Although a lot of it is automated these days, um, but they are very expensive to do these migrations. So you, you can keep your collection accessible out there. Um, <clears throat> and that's money, which comes back to advocacy. So yeah, <laughs> it's a simple answer, but... Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, how you achieve that simple answer is 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 a lot of hard work. Yeah, so much comes back to advocacy in one form or another, and you you do something, you build on what you've achieved, you let people know about it. I've got with me. I'm just kind of if I if it's possible to see this. Okay, this is a book, and it's called Australia's Lost Films. Uh, and it was published uh, in um, about 1983. Um, I'm, I'm the joint author. It's a book about what's missing uh, in Australian Australia's audiovisual history. It's sold out very quickly. Now, why would anybody want to buy such a book? People are curious about their their own film history, their TV history, their audiovisual history, and they don't know that it's all missing or how much of it's missing um, and that just become that was just one element in steps we took to increase awareness and therefore um, to get more money to go to government to go to Parliament and say we need we need more money um, but you won't get more money unless people know what you need to have and why you need to have it unless they feel that it matters and so if there's a sentiment for what is missing and for the work you're doing, you will, one way or another, eventually get the support. Um, but you have to work at it. And you have to have the, I guess, the personal conviction to say, well, it matters, I'm going to keep at it. And um, eventually it comes. Not sure if that's the, if that's a sufficient answer um, for you, Lala, but... Um, uh, it, it is it's a long road but it works over, over time ah Thank you very much for and uh, for the last I have uh, one question for me from me uh, uh, what what are the standard facilities for digital storage is there a minimum data center tire requirement uh, some level of the tire data center 
or are there any recommendation especially for digital audiovisual yeah that's special <laughs> my question that uh, we have uh, any problem in in the digital storage uh, maybe you have uh, any uh, requirement or any standard for the digital storage okay i'll jump in on that one um <clears throat> I don't think there's an actual standard. I mean, there's certainly a lot of recommendations and there might even be a standard, but I'm just not aware of it. But the basic recommendations would be um, that you use a system which is not completely proprietary, okay? So <clears throat> um, most dam systems are a little bit proprietary, but they, they still use things that will enable them to talk to other systems, okay? So you don't want a completely closed system. <clears throat> the second thing, of course, is that you really need to make sure that you have support from the, the manufacturer or the installer. To make sure that if something goes wrong, you can get the, the help you need as quickly as absolutely possible. You're not waiting six months for a, for a plug to come from the United States or from Germany, you know, that, that, that they've got the supplies and the know-how to put it together <clears throat> at that time. Similarly, for any software that, um, that you might have is that you can get training and support for that software and that you can get upgrades and that you apply the upgrades to the software. And, and, and these are sort of the, the, the very, the basic things. Then there's the, the whole issue of security around making sure that <clears throat> nothing goes into your collection that can, that can do it any harm or in your collection cannot be illegally or accessed without authorization. So good firewall security around there, limited number of people that can access it and what they can do to access it. Um, <clears throat> So to a large extent, I guess it means sort of not really having your, um, and, and I guess this is not strictly possible, but it would be having your collection. So there's no way that it's attached to the internet in any shape, manner or form. <clears throat> now that's not always feasible, I guess, for all sorts of reasons, but um, that would be an ideal. Uh, but if you do have to have it connected, which I think you probably would, um, <clears throat> If you, do, if you do have to have it connected, then you make sure that you've got the absolute best possible security there, uh, firewalls and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> my son is very clever at IT security. He, that's his job, basically. And he just tells me so many stories about organisations that shouldn't have known better um, and it, it's pretty much like having um, all your windows barred up with great big bars and a huge lock on the front door and you leave the back door open. And so many organisations are, are guilty of that. And certainly in, in, in a, a collection, which we haven't really spoken about the monetary value of a collection, um, <clears throat> but the monetary value of a collection to a nation is massive. It is huge. It's just really difficult to actually calculate it. So people tend not to. Um, but it is in terms of the value to culture, the value to creative industries, it is a massive, massive, massive resource, financial resource to a, to a company. So you want to protect that resource, which means that you do everything that you possibly can to, to do that, which means you don't leave the back door open. So when you when you've built your system, you get people to check it to make sure it is secure, um, because hackers are very clever. I mean, they really are. They they may be evil, but they are very 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 clever. And a lot of the time, they don't have any evil intent, but they yeah they shouldn't be there. <laughs> and and if the if the hackers without evil intent can get in there, then the hackers with evil intent can certainly get in there. So yeah, you really, really, really want to make sure that your security is good um, to protect that incredibly precious resource, not only in terms of culture, but also in terms of actual dollar value or rapier value or however you want to call it.
okay uh, thank you very much uh, i think uh, the discussion still uh, very much a question in in the q and a and in the chat room but i think uh, uh, limited time and if any question uh, mr ray and also mr mick maybe <coughs> still open yeah if, if any if any question for you and could I, could I, uh, um, can direct yeah danny could i suggest um, that if people have specific questions they can email, email Mick or email me. We're quite happy to try to um, respond to them in, in real time because it's very hard to do it in the course mm -hmm. of a webinar. But um, uh, And uh, you could send an email around with our, our email addresses. Yeah. We're very happy to respond to questions that people have. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Feel free. Feel free to send email to Mr. <laughs> Ray and uh, Mr. Mick. And uh, I think... Two of the, uh, the expert, uh, Mr. Ray and Mick, I think uh, still open to uh, answer uh, any question. And uh, I think this, because this is technically and also about the uh, policy also, and also the recommendation, very useful for us. I think uh, it uh, uh, will be advantage for us. And for the last, uh, I hope, uh, Mr. Ray and Mick uh, can give a uh, final remarks, uh, maybe some suggestion for us uh, or any recommendation. Uh, just uh, one or two sentences that can be suggestion for uh, our activity. Uh, please, Mr. Mick first, and after that, uh, Ray will be continuing. Okay, just a couple of just a couple of sentences about things. Um, <clears throat> Archives, even national archives, tend to be viewed as kind of government or, or, or something else, but they're not. Archives are about people. Um, it's the story of people. Now, whether those people are in government or whether they're musicians or filmmakers or, or people just recording family events, um, it's about people. Uh, the... National Archives Solomon Islands have a have a, a little theme song that they 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 sing, and it's it's got a beautiful chorus line which says "Archive me, archive you," and that says it all about an archive. It's about people, okay? It's the content, but it's about people being able to access that content. So yeah, that's <laughs> that's my that's my thoughts about it anyway. And perhaps Ray has some <laughs> some additional ones, but. Um, yeah. Nick, you're right, because I think archives not only about people, they're about, about, about passionate people. Mm -hmm. uh, once you get into this field, you feel very strongly about it, and it's why you stay there and you persist with it. And um, so if there's, if there's a word I would like to leave, it is persistence. Don't give up. Um, you will always be working with fewer people, less money and less equipment than you need. That's always true. So you're always working out how best to use what you've got and how to get more of it. And what keeps you going um, is the fact that, yes, it is about people. It's about what we keep. It's about understanding the, the, the crucial importance of keeping our memory um, and uh, not letting it disappear. And that takes um, the persistence of people like us globally if you look at the people who are involved uh, in audiovisual archiving around the world, there's not many of us actually. And we have a vast international responsibility. So we actually hold all these things in our hands. So we we, we keep with it, we, we don't give up, we persist. Thank you very much for Ray and Mick for your Uh, participation in this uh, workshop. Terima kasih banyak uh, kepada dua narasumber uh, atas partisipasinya dan juga kesediaan untuk memberikan paparan dan ini sangat menarik sekali buat kami di Indonesia dan juga buat teman-teman yang lain yang hadir ada dari Singapura yang mungkin juga mengalami masalah serupa terkait dengan preservasi kita di negara tropis ya dan juga khususnya audiovisual arsip yang Uh, apa terkait magnetic tape uh, kaset ini 
menjadi problem yang umum di negara kami ter, uh, untuk melakukan preservasi jangka panjang. Dan uh, apalagi tadi juga ada penekanan bahwa ini sebaiknya nanti diaksesnya agar bisa lebih luas ya menggunakan media uh, internet ya atau melalui web dan uh, beberapa kendala tadi juga sangat banyak disampaikan dan ini sangat menarik untuk bisa kita ulas secara detail ya terkait advokasi terkait mass storage terkait dengan uh, beberapa uh, tantangan yang uh, harus kita bisa nanti spesifikkan menj- uh, ke dalam materi-materi yang uh, selanjutnya ya ini bisa kita lanjutkan di materi-materi nanti mungkin workshop yang lain dan uh, kita harapkan Mr. Ray, Mr. Mick uh, masih bersedia untuk nanti kita uh, undang kembali misalkan di kesempatan yang berbeda dan semoga uh, kita bisa bertemu lagi dan sekali lagi terima kasih banyak ya kami apresiasi kedua narasumber dan uh, dari saya cukup sekian kami tutup uh, dan saya kembalikan kepada Uh, MC Mbak Berli, uh, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Bapak Dani Sugiarto yang telah memimpin jalannya diskusi pada siang hari ini. Hadirin yang kami hormati, demikian selesai sudah acara kita pada hari ini. Atas nama Panitia Penyelenggara, kami ucapkan terima kasih banyak atas perhatian Bapak dan Ibu, serta kami ucapkan permohonan maaf yang sebesar-besarnya apabila terdapat perkataan maupun perbuatan yang kurang berkenan. Semoga informasi yang diterima pada hari ini dapat bermanfaat bagi kita semua. Selamat siang. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Mix. See you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Danny. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. <laughs> See you. See you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.